mini skirt on, dip my body in glitter. Pop, pop, form sneakers, all the boys want a picture. Two, two, four, and cars, I make rich look richer. Save your breath, baby, I'm not going home with y'all. Mini skirt on, dip my body in glitter. Hello, hello, hello. You are now tuned in to the A Little Bit A Lot podcast. I'm your host, Kristen, and this week we have a very, very special episode. I have a special, fantastic, magical guest, Allie. Hello, girl. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Very excited to talk with you about a multitude of things. Yes, I'm so excited to have you. Like, you're really just giving me the variety that I need so we can come in and switch up the conversation a little bit. I love that. If you guys don't know Allie, she is amazing. She's doing great things. She's a self-published writer with two books released already. Your goal is to heal through poetry. And she has a range of emotions and themes on life with personal growth, self-compassion, self-love, and resiliency through mental illness. And you're a borderline personality disorder advocate. We love that. You got it, girl. Someone's got to fight for us. Exactly. I just love that representation. You know that my podcast like often focuses on mental health, but I also have like, you know, different topics that I keep it lighter at the same time. So, you know, with the mental health episodes, I just really want to make sure that people feel seen, you know, and heard. And I feel like that's the kind of message that you want to convey as well just for people to feel seen and people to feel like they're not alone in their mental health journey you got it sis again someone has to do it someone has to start talking about it and i believe once one person plants that seed those seeds will start popping up around the world and once all of those fields of sunflowers have come up we're going to take over the world exactly i love that like real takeover like mental health is not something that you should be ashamed about no you know it's extremely common and i feel like a lot of times like boomers are like what's going on but it's like you probably dealt with it too when you were younger and you just didn't even have the words to express it so it's like i feel like we've all had our experiences with it at some point exactly you know and i was raised by my grandparents though i do have a dad single dad I see it. I see it waved through the generations as far as grandpa, who's 83, to my dad, who's 56, to me, who's 23. I am breaking the generational cycles and the generational trauma, but it's it's waved through. Like, no one can say they don't have dark nights of the soul sometimes because it happens to everybody. And through my poetry, I just want people to know when they're in that space, when they're in that dark night of the soul, they're not alone. Pick up Bloom, pick up a generation of sunflowers because Allie's gone through it. She's gone through it. And I just hope my words can give people that hug they need during that dark night of the soul. Because I can't. Because of physical distance. Exactly. It's like, you know, a virtual hug. Heck yeah. You got that, right? (laughs) I love that. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions here just so that Mm -hmm. way you guys can get to know Allie. Um, But of course, before we get into the gags, already know to make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Make sure that once you listen to this episode, if you're listening on Spotify, hit that follow button, rate that five stars. And of course, on Apple Podcasts, leave a review to let you let me know what you guys think of the episode, what you guys think of Allie. So go ahead and support. And of course, at the top of the episode, since we're fresh in, let people know where they can find you. Yeah, most definitely. So if you want to buy my work, you can go to my Etsy shop, Jen of Sunflowers. And I'm sure, Kristen, you know what, you'll link it, of course, but Mm -hmm. Jen of Sunflowers is my Etsy store where you can purchase both or individual volumes. And if you want to follow my work, talk to me, see my everyday life, see my things I'm enthusiastic about, just see snippets of my poetry, Allie underscore author on Instagram, at Allie underscore author. So you can connect with me those ways. Yeah. Awesome. I love your Instagram. You have such a variety. Like right now you've been doing the series with the Legos. Yeah. I yeah. love being able to participate with that and like vote to be like, what is she going to do next week? <laughs> and and I'll tell you something. The reason the Lego is such a part of my page is this is actually a great segue into one of my books here. There is a piece in Bloom and it's titled 22 Reasons to Stay. I just turned 23, but I had wrote this when I turned 22. And one of my 22 reasons, number five, is Lego. Because Lego Lego has satiated the need to impulsively shop and buy. That's something borderlines, unfortunately, usually struggle with. At least I really did and still do. 
and Lego satiates that need <laughs> to, to, to purchase. It's, it's one expensive big purchase. We're good. We're done. And now we're going to do it. I just love Lego. It's a stress reliever. It also allows the parts of my brain that want to control things to, yeah. to zone in and count and inventorize and buy and sell. I don't know. I'm just an entrepreneur at heart. So I like the transactional, I guess, part of buying Lego and building it. It's, it's silly. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no, I honestly feel the same way about Sims because I have a restaurant on my Sims game. <laughs> okay, everyone's been telling me get into Sims, and I'm just not a video game girly. I'm just not. like. And I, I wasn't know. either, but Sims changed the game for me. It's like I've got my yeah. family that I've been playing with since literally 2018. No. And now she's got a husband, three kids, and a restaurant, and like also a store, a clothing store. And it's like. It's just something that it does to my brain where I like I can sell things and like I'm like wow she's an entrepreneur she's a business I girl. I am literally the only one out of my my girls that don't have Sims. I play Heyday. Shout out to Heyday uh, on on yes. App Store. It's silly. I've been playing that since 2014. <laughs> but other than that, it's Lego. Lego is my video game. But I yeah. think I need to check out Sims because everyone's nagging at me. Get Sims, Ali. Get get Sims. You'll like it. Yeah, you might feel the same way that Sims, I mean, that Legos make you feel. Yeah. But I totally get the reasoning behind it. And I just feel like it's, Legos is just such a good hobby. I have two coworkers who are really into it. They got a holiday set that they built around their Christmas tree. And I also like oh, the yeah. that they do with like plants. You know, you oh, have a little bouquet. I got all those. Got all Yes, they're so yeah. pretty. Yeah, yeah, she's got all of them. I probably have at least $2,000 Canadian worth of Lego in my house. Oh my gosh. And I'd say 70% of it's built and displayed and the other you know 70 80 90 the, the other 30 percent i would say is brand new that are sitting in my basement that i will resell in a year from now when they're not being made and then i make a good buck on them <laughs> ah, wait no that's a good idea honestly so for all my lego people out there <laughs> Take it's, advice. yeah no it's actually really good if you find a sale that's on clear a sale a set that's on clearance it's like just snag that up put it in the basement for now and resell it when it's not being sold anymore retired right. sets go for so much money wow i had no clue this is like a whole thing that you could like really get into so I love it is it is <laughs> <laughs> and i'm and i'm 23 and i say oh you know i feel silly doing lego no the people i Ooh. sell to 50 60 year olds come into my door from facebook marketplace buying my stuff it's it's wild it's such a community yeah, it is it really is i feel like lego and sims transcends age like it doesn't oh, it does. matter it's such a calming and like just innocent type of hobby so it's like i love it i felt the same way where i was just like i'm you know 27 i'm like, here I am, right. you know almost 30 like still playing sims but yeah. whatever you got to do for your mental health you can just step out of being big you for two seconds yeah. and just let let inner Allie, let inner Kristen come out and just be and enjoy Lego and enjoy Sims. Play and explore. Because mm -hmm. if any, that's the human experience, if anything. Yeah. You got it. I agree. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm glad we got that conversation because I really wanted to talk to you about that because I've been like, <laughs> loving this little series. I was like, oh wow. Because I always wanted to be a Lego girly. So seeing you speed build. Let's get into it so satisfying get into it <laughs> actually I, i'm gonna do a little uh, little secret drop here in the new year in 2024 for those who are not following me yet i definitely suggest that you do because i do believe i'm going to do a lego and book giveaway sometime in 2024 like you know both books and like a sunflower set or like roses or cherry blossoms yeah yeah Yes, you heard it here, folks. So make sure you follow the IG to stay up to date. Yes, yes, Because I do. just love seeing that part of you. I just feel like, you know, people need to get on that because it's, it's so satisfying to see. Okay, well, great. All right, so let's get into the first question that I wanted to ask yes, you yes. about what got you into writing and how long have you been writing? Yeah, so actually, I, I talked to my grandma about this, who's like my mom. Nana tells me that I would narrate stories to her dictate stories to her and she would write them down and she would then put them on Microsoft Word. I was as young as three or four at that time. So she's always been a words a gal from as young as three or four. At 14, you know, going into high school, English, they want to take that somewhat seriously. You're learning the foundations, the basics of writing exams and papers, articles, whatnot. And uh, yeah, I really got into poetry at 14 because I had some really great English teachers at the high school I was attending. But Rupi Carr. Rupi Carr's book, Milk and Honey, grabbed my soul, twisted it, and then released it. 
I, Rupi Carr got me through very dark times. Her work is, actually my work's inspired by hers. It's very raw, genuine, gut punchy, short, meaningful, unfiltered writing. And um, yeah, she really, really pulled me through when I was 14 and inspired me. Unfortunately, that year was very difficult. I was 14 trying to find myself. There was family turmoil. There was inner turmoil. There was relationship turmoil. It was, it was difficult. So my voice, I felt like it was snuffed at that time. So I turned back to poetry again when I was 18 or 19. I'm 23 now. But I turned back to writing at 18 or 19 as a means of processing what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. I find that I can be transparent when I'm writing, more transparent than I can be with a therapist. As I say, the pen and paper, are they don't judge. They don't judge. They just listen. It gives gives your, vo- your void a voice and inner you, little you, a voice. At least that's how I view my poetry. I let those right. parts of myself speak. Um, but yeah, I really took it seriously at 19, 20, um, end of 2019 was really difficult, separated from a partner at that time, lost myself. And I figured I'm, I'm going to show my family and friends how it is to live with what I've lived with, with the burdens I've been carrying. And I'm going to do it through poetry. So that's how my first uh, publication of Generation of Sunflowers came to be. It's just short and sweet, but it's, it's a lot. It's a hard, difficult, raw read. But it was needed. It was very cathartic for me to get that out. And once I found that it really helped to process these things through words and poetry, I kept going to publish my second collection, Bloom, this year, 2023, June. So I guess it snowballed. It really turned into a healthy coping mechanism for me, a healthy way of processing without being disassociated, because unfortunately, I live very disassoci- disassociatedly. That's a word. Yes. And uh, (laughs) this is a way that it pulls me back into reality to really look at what's happened. And that's why my poetry is so raw and so blunt, actually, dare I say. Um, Yeah, I'm not holding anything back. I I can't because void needs to speak and inner child needs to speak. And I don't need to filter that. And it's not for everybody, but it's for some people and it will reach and it is reaching the people it needs to. I love that. And I think I, I, it's just funny that you say that because a couple of days ago, there's this artist that I like named Queen Nija. And she was just on a podcast, or I think it was, or something where she was discussing kind of the same way, whether it's songwriting or poetry yeah. or any type of creative medium, yeah. she feels like she can express herself better through songs than talking yeah. to someone. Mm-hmm. So it's just funny that you say that because a lot of creatives often feel the same way. Yeah. And I think growing up, you know, with, you know, the interest that I had in writing and reading, I almost felt the same way because it lets you escape and focus yep. in on what you're feeling to its core. Yeah. So I I really love that for you. Yes. You Thank you. Focus on the inner, hi- the inner child healing of it all being able to say this is something I can focus on without feeling, you know, like I'm disassociating Yeah. because you have to give those feelings that chance to shine. Yes. Because if you're living your life through disassociation, the majority of the time, you're never really going to do the healing work. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. And you you shared your, um, you know, your muse, if you will. So that's basically what made you choose poetry as your medium. Because I know like in school you do writing and they talk to you about all the different forms. Yeah. You you could have chosen any type of medium, but poetry was what got you. Short and sweet. I'm not someone that writes long academic papers well. I'm not someone that hits word counts. I really struggled with that when I did a year at university, but uh, I like short, yeah, sweet, hard. gut punchy, like... and it's just... Mm-mm. I don't like fluff. I don't like using... I don't know. I, I use big words. I use concise vocabulary so that I don't have to ramble on. Because I don't have a long attention span. I've got a very short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> so you know i write i write the way that i would want to read something like i'm yeah. not going to pick up a poetry book that's two or three pages just for one poem N- no thanks i want something short mm. and sweet that is going to get my attention i can digest it and understand it and not and you can feel the feeling know, let, without having to be there forever <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it yeah 
Wow, I love that because that was one thing that I really wanted to ask you about was like why poetry, but that makes so much sense. The attention span, and then on top of that, just quickly conveying the message. So yeah. I think that yeah. that's that worked out great for you. Okay, so yeah. now that we've gotten into like the writing, you know, the why, what was the influence on that? How long you've been doing it, which has been quite a while, which is impressive. Yeah. The fact Thank that you. you, you know, came back to it later and then somehow it created a snowball effect. That's really interesting yeah. to learn about. And now you've got two books. Yes. Did you even yes. start with the intention of knowing that this was going to go beyond the no. one? Or no. like you said, no. it just naturally snowballed. No, absolutely not. I literally wrote A Generation of Sunflowers to help process what had happened at the end of 2019 and, and prior to that. But this was written for family and friends. 65 copies initially were printed. That's it. That's all. And after that 65th copy went out, the messages I was getting saying, you need to get this into the hands of strangers. You've got to get this into Indigo Chapters, the major bookstores in Canada. You, you have to do something with this. This is going to help people. And it took me a long time to let, you know, to really understand that, let it sink in and give myself the pat on the back that, yeah, you know what, this could do something very good. Yeah. And finally, put myself out there, went, got into bookstores, opened an Etsy store, you know, from there, it snowballed. People internationally were buying my work. Um, Australia, UK, Dubai, Germany, you know, it was nuts. It was going everywhere. Messages internationally saying you were validating the human experience, you were validating living with BPD, you were validating all of the hardship I've gone through. And it's showing me I can get out on the other side. So from that, I started writing Bloom. I started writing Bloom in June of 2021, when my grandpa ended up in the hospital, and we found the metastatic prostate cancer. Um, the first piece that started this book was a piece I wrote for him. And um, I would actually like to recite it, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So the poem is called, I Wish I Had Listened. And I'll just give a bit of context. I wrote this because being young and ignorant, not really listening to what my grandparents, in specific grandpa, what he had to say, his stories, always just thinking, "Ugh, they're boring. I don't care. You're just not listening. You're young and ignorant in one ear out the other. But it really occurred to me very quickly in that two weeks he stayed in the hospital in June of 21. I, I need to listen because I don't know how much longer you're going to be here. I don't know how much longer you're going to be able to remember your story. So I wish I had listened. And this is for Grandpa. He's still alive, mind you, but yes. this is for Grandpa. I wish I had listened. Your stories have never meant so much to me as they do right now. I wish I had listened Short and sweet and Just impactful. Everybody, I think, could wish. relate with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness he's still here with us. That's something that me and you have in common that we've talked about in the DM. That, yeah. You know, yeah. we've both dealt with that. My dad had prostate cancer and they're both still kicking. Yeah. I know that's right. I yeah. love that. And it's just something so wholesome about dedicating that moment to him so that way you can just yeah. simply process while it's going on and just, yeah. all right, now, we, now we're going to deal with it. You got it. And it's hard. Like, that. again, living with that disassociated film covering my eyes most of the time, it's, it's very hard to let that sink in because it's survival technique and method, right? If we don't exactly. let it sink into our skin, it's, it's not going to hurt us we're invincible. It's just going to bounce right off of our armor. But at some point you have to let it sink in. And I do believe when I wrote that piece, I did start to allow it to sink in, but it really didn't sink in until November 24th, 2023, when we found out it moved into his lymph nodes. Um, life has changed for me drastically since November 24th. And that was recently. Um, yeah. I'm not disassociated and it's sunk in what's happening and what could happen and not could will happen. Right. And that's life. Yeah. And, it, but at the same time, it's like you're, you're creating something so beautiful out of pain and that's just such an unfortunate yeah. part about life, but it, it's going to help people and it already is helping people. So, wow. I love that. It's helped me. Yeah. Getting that out, it's helped me. And just sitting there and rereading that is like, 
yeah, you wrote that. You really mean what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And on top yeah. of that, like you mentioned before, you know, with you reaching people across, you know, different regions, it's like, it's getting global yeah. early. You need to pat yourself on the back. The fact that you're doing this by yourself and you're impacting people all around. That's iconic. I love that for you. I'm working super hard because unfortunately people living with borderline are, are demonized. We're the unseen. We're the people that don't want to be treated. And quite frankly, it's BS. Uh, in Canada, it's not talked about. There is no one, dare I say, cornering the market with it, being candid with it. Um, hell, there really, really isn't even any resources where I am in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Someone has to do it, as I said, starting this episode. I put my best foot forward, and I'm being that siren. I'm being that beacon of light and hope. I'm using my voice for good, because people have not found theirs yet, or don't know how to connect with their inner voice. So I'm speaking for us, for my community, not just BPD, you know, but that's what I personally really struggle with and yeah, advocate for. Really focus and with. on your specific situation. Yeah. Well, that gives us a good se- segue because I did wanted to ask you just for those who don't know, like what is borderline personality disorder? What is your definition? Yeah. Like, how do you interpret it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Actually, this was maybe probably two months ago. I was doing a book signing. I've done six, but this, is, I think, was my fourth or fifth one. And I had someone come up to me, and I was giving my spiel, like, hey, I'm Allie. I'm a 23-year-old self-published poet and BPD advocate. I write to destigmatize living with borderline here in Manitoba and start the conversation. She says, what is BPD? Is it bipolar? No, honey. No, it's not. Right then and there, my purpose just re-clicked, refocused. Bam, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. Borderline personality disorder is a personality disorder. Bipolar is a mood disorder. They manifest super differently. Um, BPD is not something necessarily that can be, I don't know if I should say this, but cured. It's something you learn to integrate into yourself using coping mechanisms, therapy, medication, your support network. So going back to the beginning of the question, BPD usually stems from an environmental trauma or fundamental childhood trauma, be it neglect, be it abandonment, be it sexual abuse. Unfortunately, all three of those things happened to me. And... I'm now seeing the culmination of that as an older woman. But, alas, you can integrate it into your life. It's not a death sentence. It's not something to be afraid of. Um, I view it as a superpower, actually. Why? We feel things so passionately, so deeply. And yeah, that's great. But it's also really detrimental and it's really hard to pull yourself out of when you're in that passionate, upset state. Um, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of writing, a lot of therapy, a lot of introspection, looking at myself and my life in the mirror and realizing that it's okay that I have this and I don't need to be afraid of it. I don't need to be afraid of it. It's difficult because psychologists, psychiatrists, practitioners don't want to diagnose a mood or personality disorder until you're an adult. So in Canada here, it's 18, where you are, 21. So I got my diagnosis when I was 20, and I knew it's what I'd been living with. I I found out about it when I was 16 in high school. I took a psychology course, figured out this was probably what I was struggling with, but I kept that to myself for a while until it really became prominent in my life at, you know, 19 specifically. And I took it and I ran Basically, I went to that psychiatrist's office, told her what I thought I was dealing with, and two sessions in, my hypothesis was proven correct. So, a lot of people, unfortunately, have really horrible stories of how they got their diagnosis, being afraid of it, not understanding it, going to Google, and seeing serial killers come up on the list first. None of, none of that happened with me. Fortunately, it was, you're not crazy, 
you're acting the way you're acting because of how you were raised, the environment you lived in. You're doing the best with what you know. And now we know what it is, and now we're going to work on it, and we're going to integrate it into your life because we're not going to let it completely cover you like it did your mother and your father and your great-grandfather. We're not doing that. Generational trauma, breaking those curses. The buck stops at my feet. No child is going to live the life I've lived. Though, yes, it was fruitful, full of love from my grandparents. Right. Not my immediate parents. And, and that's fine. I'm, I'm blessed and grateful I have Nana and Grandpa. But it stops at my feet. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Bring awareness to it. Let people know it's okay. Um, it doesn't make you a bad person. You're not a cheater. You're not manipulative. You're not a monster. Because that's what society perceives us as. And that's what I'm here to stop and break. That's not what we are. <laughs> People can right. change. People can change. I was not a nice person before my diagnosis. And it's not like getting my diagnosis changed everything. It just shifted my perspective and made me understand maybe this is why you're lashing out. This is why you're so upset. This is why you dislike yourself so much. I totally went off on a tangent. My bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. We're here to hear about your story. And I think that all ties into helping people get a clear understanding of BPD as a whole, like hearing that story. And it's just, you know, I, I always have such a soft spot because of, you know, my sister, she's had like a lot of like, you know, health issues and health and mental health are all yep. tied into one. So having yeah. to advocate for yourself in the way that you had to. Yep. Uh, it's just, I resonate with that so much because it's like, there's so many times where she's been in the same situation where she's like, I think this is also happening to me. I yep. think this is going on. And then people don't want to take children seriously. And it just sucks that you have to go through so much without yep. help, without guidance or assistance. And then wait until you get to a certain point to be like, okay, well, after everything I've gone through with this turmoil, without mm -hmm. having anything to guide me, mm -hmm. here's the evidence that I've collected what are you going to do about it? And then you get help. And it's like, what yeah. about the in-between period? What about that? Yes. I think what you're doing to advocate for what you're dealing with is going to help other people because it's like something needs to be done about that in-between time. Yep. You know, like yep. we need more, you know, priority put in children so that yes. way, once you become an adult, that transition is easier. And it's like, yeah. it, you know, I just never want it to be a situation where it's like, oh, I'm so sorry for you or feel pity. But I yeah. empathize with your experience because I've directly dealt with it in some form with my sister's yeah. voice, you know, not being heard and feeling like nothing can be done about it until you get to that certain age. And it sucks. Completely. I, I totally agree. Completely yeah. agree. You have to fight for yourself because I'm going to put it very bluntly. No one else will fight for yourself as hard and as fiercely as you will. Right. That's one thing that I've had to literally tell my sister the same thing. It's like, you have to be an advocate for you yep. because yep. these doctors, they're just there to do what they got to do and then move on to the next. So in yep. that 45 minutes that you have them in your face, you got to fight. <laughs> you yep. got to do what you got to do and say, yes. this is what I have going on. I need you to hear my voice. So mm -hmm. the fact that you were able to do that, I know it's not easy for a lot of people because some people feel like they're just not going to be heard. So then what is the point of even getting the help? But the yeah. fact that you were brave enough in that situation, you know, to actually say, this is what's going on. Yeah. Where can we go from here? I think is also a big step that not a lot of people yeah. acknowledge is important because some people don't even do that. Yeah, it was hard. Like I did have to hit rock bottom. I did have to have family members and friends gather around me and say like you're not okay you need yeah. help because I, I lost myself and I said yeah you're right I do I do I can't live like this anymore but maybe there's nothing wrong maybe I'm just misbehaving maybe there's actually nothing wrong and I'm just being a promiscuous baddie 18 19 year old no no that wasn't the case it it, mm -hmm. it, it was borderline and PTSD and 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 you know so alas exactly. Well, yeah, I, I love that you had to, you know, love that you got the help that you needed and that you're yep. on your journey. Yeah. Um, speaking of that journey, like, 
what has it been like navigating it since you have gotten the help you needed and what Oof. things do you do to cope like that yeah. you learned just so people can see like what it could be like once they step into that situation and how to move navigate it i think the first thing i really tried to do was reframe my mindset get rid of that negative self talk for one was a big one so for instance i do something wrong oh you're so stupid you're so dumb like you're a dumb bitch. Like, why? Why? You're ugly. Like, you don't look good in that. Why do I need to talk to myself that way? I am not a dumb bitch. I I am beautiful. Like, I wholeheartedly believe these things. Why do I have to have this negative self-talk with myself? So that was the first thing I really tried to eliminate. Um, as I am a caregiver for someone with vascular dementia and someone living with BPD, me, the motto I take is one day at a time. It's one day at a time. With BPD, you're not ever going to have the same day. And with dementia, you're never going to have the same day. You never know what you're going to get. And if you can't take it one day at a time, you take it one hour at a time. And November 24th, getting those cancer results with grandpa, I took it one hour at a time. And if that's too much, one minute at a time. You, do, you just do what you have to do to get through to the next day. Most days for me are pretty good. Yeah, I go through an array of emotions, you know. Maybe someone looks at me the wrong way, and I, in my head, it rattles me or it triggers me, the big T word. But I just take a deep breath, and I move on. In the past, I probably would have let that kind of marinate in my head for a while. And this might sound silly, a very silly example, but just as simple as someone staring at me or looking at me the wrong way, no, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> um, but I guess back to your question. There are highs, there are lulls, there are peaks, there are valleys. And lately, since the 24th of November, it's been, it's been a low. It has been a low. Yeah. But I am embracing it. I am letting out whatever needs to come out, be it words, be it poetry, be it tears. I am just honoring my mind, body, and soul right now more than I ever have. Because grief is not something that you can stifle. It will eat you. It will completely envelop your whole being until you are nothing and a shell of a person. So a recommendation I can, I can put out there is allow yourself to feel without restrictions and make that safe space for yourself to be able to do so. And maybe that's with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a best friend or yourself and a podcast, or yourself, and a good show, or music, or a teddy bear, or a blankie. You just, you have to honor every emotion you're feeling. And sometimes they're going to be bigger than others, and sometimes they're going to be quite minuscule. But all of them are justified and appropriate. They make you you. And again, one day at a time. <laughs> that's that's my best advice. There Again, there are periods where I'm doing very well, and there are periods where we get bad news and we have to grieve and take it one day at a time. It's, you never know what you're going to get. I <laughs> think like that's the best thing I can say, and I hope that's coming across positively. It's not, it's not meant to be negative at all. No, yeah. Um, it's the truth. You truly do have to take it one minute at a time and tailor it to what you need it to be. Yeah, yes. I will tell you, back in 2020, every day was grim. Every day was horrible. Yeah. Now, I don't really have horrible days. I do have the odd grim day, and that's okay. It's a lapse. My therapist does not like me to use the word relapse, but it's a lapse. Because, Allie, you're so friggin' strong. You have your lapse, and you get right back on the horse, and you go. For instance, I'll get quite personal here. I had a... Had a actually quite a large breakdown middle of November. My grandma was present and I went completely hysterical. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I did some things I shouldn't, said some things I shouldn't have. But after being in that intense emotion for an hour, I sat down, calmed myself down, and I got back on the horse and I rode it and I just kept going. Two years ago, that wouldn't have happened. I would have, the whole day, the next day proceeding would have been just rough, bad. I allowed myself to feel what I needed to feel to get it out. And then we move on. 
and we go on. Pick yourself back up. That's an important lesson. I think sometimes like yeah. a lot of people can resonate with that, whether you have BPD or not. Oh yeah. A lot sure. of times people don't even have like the ability to have emotional regulation in that way. So yeah. it just is literally a testament to how far you're coming with using those tools in your toolbox to cope. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's like, hard to go to therapy all day, but once it comes time, when you have that breakdown moment, how am I going to take this toolbox, open it up and choose which coping school skill to use to get yeah. me through this moment? And you said, all right, let me get the hammer. Let me get the drill. I'm going to yeah. do what I got to do to pick myself up through this day. You got like, that right. That's a pat on the back right there in itself. Like, because it, it's a lot no. going on right now. It was you. bad. Like, it, it was bad. I, I hadn't had an episode like that in a long time. But it was a culmination of a lot of stuff. And yeah, it was not good. That day was not good. But it was an hour of a complete freak out. <laughs> and I just cried it out, screamed it out. And um, I picked myself back up and got on the horse. And the next day I, I went to therapy to and I told, yeah, yeah, I told my therapist and she said, you know, this doesn't surprise me that this happened, but it doesn't surprise me how you got up and just kept going. Because that's you. You're resilient. Resiliency flows in the Loyan's blood. It's shown time and time again through, through my father's trials and tribulations, my grandmother's trials and tribulations, my grandfather's. It runs in our blood. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed for that. Yes. Like, you're... You're really just making, you know, something of the name with your family. And I know that at the end of the day, they're, you know, so incredibly proud of you, you know, your grandparents. And I just feel like I, I love that even though you have your own struggles, like you're still being such a selfless person, being there for them while also prioritizing you and putting in the work, yeah. you know, every day to make sure that you guys are good as a unit. I love that. It's, it's very difficult because with, having BPD. Um, historically, we are people pleasers. We don't yeah. know how to set the boundary, how to put ourselves first, even if our mental and physical health is at at risk. We're just going to put everyone in front of us, ahead of us. And it's bringing us right back to my publication, Bloom. I have a piece I would like to share again, if that's okay with you. Yes. It's, um, it's actually called Boundaries Are Healthy. Wow. Boundaries are healthy, and I wrote this when I had to move my grandfather into memory care after he had a stroke, and it was go, 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 go for him, go, 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 go for everyone, and I was falling flat. Like, I was at the point where I felt that I should maybe check myself in somewhere, but instead I wrote this poem, and I started to implement these boundaries in the best way that I could. So, without further ado, Boundaries Are Healthy, from Bloom, my second publication. Boundaries are healthy. It's easy to set boundaries with myself. It's easy to tell others how I've set boundaries with myself. It's easy to have boundaries in general. Yet, Setting boundaries with those same people is not. Somehow my no means I am unlikable. Somehow pleading I can't right now means I'm selfish. Somehow saying I need time for myself means I am weak. Constant anxiety over any misstep looms over my bright, eager aura. But to continue on this self-preserving, tumultuous journey... I must accept that I do not owe apologies or explanations. What is most beneficial to my well-being is of utmost importance. Boundaries are healthy. I was just going to snap. You ate that. Oh, man. Just reading, just reading that with the conviction and just writing that even. Uh, Saying no is very difficult for me, and it historically always has been. But I am saying no now. 
I am putting myself first. So I am not getting sick or sick physically. I have to. Right. Boundaries are healthy. How are you else are you going to be there for your grandparents if you're not going to be there for you? You have to show up for yourself and that's what you're doing in this season. You caught that right. You got that right, sis. And I just hope that that poem, someone reading that, that's a complete pushover and a people pleaser can say, yeah, I got to I got to say no. Like this girl understands. She's if she can do it, hell I can do it. Exactly. I can do it. You know? <sighs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I have just had such a good time talking with you. I think this is just a great segue for us to get into our you know, last segment because we got some spoken word right there. Guys, if that's not resonating with you, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> spoken word is so damn powerful. Like slam poetry, it spoken is. word. I love it. But I should mention I'm a performer at heart. I am a classically trained musician. So I yes. do believe my voice training kind of lends to this. Yeah, so for that, really I'm blessed. It. Thank you. Love that. Okay, so on my show, I do a segment called Favorite Thing of the Week. You know, I have yeah. a little jingle, Favorite Thing of the Week. <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. is your favorite thing of this week? What's like my favorite thing that I've done? Yeah, it could be like a song. I know I've seen on your um, Instagram. Is it Melanie Martinez? You like? Oh my uh, god! Yeah, Yeah, like it could be a song. (laughs) It could be an activity that you've done this week. Okay. Okay. Gone. Something you Um, bought. It could just be anything. Like, what made you feel like? Oh, this is my favorite thing that I've gone through, or listened to, or seen, or you know, experienced. Okay. Well, I I was going to say my event that I hosted on Friday night with the Sober Families Alliance here in Winnipeg. Oh yes, I saw that. Bloom together. I don't. That's a good highlight. Right. I don't have footage posted yet. It's been a busy weekend. I'll get to it today. But I was going to say that event. It was incredible. The prep was just getting ready for it. it was so exciting. I was nervous, but I remember we're breaking stigma. We're doing this for a you know a good cause. I was going to say that, but you brought up Mel. Melanie Martinez is. She speaks to the core of Allery. That's my real name. She speaks to me in a way that nobody else has and does. She speaks to adult Allie. She speaks to teenage Allie. She speaks to little baby kid Allie. I absolutely love Melanie Martinez. I have her tattoo, her cheese tattoo, right here. Oh my gosh, wait, that's so cute. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And um, I have prioritized myself and I am setting those boundaries. I'm 23 and I need to live as a 23 year old, at least a little bit this year because my twenties have been wrapped up in caregiving, intense caregiving. Yeah. I bought me and my bestie two tickets to the trilogy tour, Jan- January, June 9th, 2024 in Toronto, at the Scotiabank arena. And I am just, <laughs> huh. Oh my god, no. You're no, like I'm really I'm, I'm, I'm complete I'm gooped and gagged like all of it. You've got no idea. I have been wanting to see Mel since I was 14 and I'm 23 now. Couldn't go in uh uh was it 2020 because of COVID. She did her K to 12. Couldn't do that. She just came to Toronto in July for the Portals tour. Couldn't go. Grandpa was like full-fledged confused. He just moved into a care home. Like I couldn't just up and leave. Yeah. So I prioritized myself and I am going to Melanie Martinez's The Trilogy Tour with my illustrator and bestie, Kyla Jackson, June 9th of 24. And we're going to have one hell of a weekend. We're going to be 23 for one weekend. And I'm so excited. I have bawled about it. I've yelled and squealed about it. Like I'm... I'm I'm back into my Mel era. Like I'm that's my era I'm in right now. I'm in Mama Mel's era. So Oh, she's probably gonna get you through these next few months for sure. Because you're gonna have something to look forward to. Allie, I'm so excited for you. I can't wait for you to have fun. Concerts are my thing. So you're gonna I know, turn I, up. <laughs> I wrote down I was I, right before I went on the podcast with you, I watched um Being a Kid of Divorce Makes You a Baddie. Oh yes. <laughs> because I I am a granddaughter of divorce and um Nan and Grandpa divorced. It was really ugh. And my dad with many women over the years have had to be split up. So I guess I am that baddie. But bringing it back, I wrote down Kristen Pisces and a big concert person. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
right here. I wrote oh it right God. down here. Yes. What I is the best that. concert you've been to? Honestly, it for me it has to be K-pop. At the Scotia okay. Bank Arena. I've been to the oh. Scotia Bank. I talked about that in my episode with my dad because it's about four hours away from me. Oh my um, and we yeah. No way. <laughs> yes. It's just one so province we, over, so Yes, yes. And I, I talked about that with my dad because we had a funny story because I thought it was pronounced Scadia. And then okay. we got to the event, the venue and he was like, he looks up and he's like, this whole time you've been singing Scadia and Scotia. And it was so funny to me. So it's like a fond memory. So yeah, my favorite uh, memory for a concert, the best concert I've been to yeah. is at the Scotia Bank Arena too. When I went to go see my favorite K-pop artist, uh, Got7, I was literally right at the barricade right there they're <gasps> splashing water on us with water bottles I'm oh my god water's in my eye yep. i'm like you know what i'll do it again <laughs> yeah like let's just rain on me more. <laughs> literally that's how it felt so it's like yeah. i'm hoping that you can be able to just have that good experience oh. scotia fake's really nice i liked the venue so yeah i am I'm excited just, for you i'm telling my grandpa and my grandma and my partner and everyone around me i can die happy after that i am going to get all the life i need from that concert the vibes the love the music the vibrations all of it i'm gonna get my life yeah she's gonna get her That's life what there. i love about <laughs> it like feeling the vibrations and just the fact that you're surrounded by hundreds of people who for a fact like the same thing a big like. family yes yeah yeah i love yeah. that well i'm trying to think yeah. of what my favorite thing of this week is and i can't really think about it it's so hard for me to i always just have to say um let's see I had to prioritize a self-care moment this week because I was having a really, really bad day um, the other day because I woke mm-hmm. up from a bad dream. And yeah, I know about that. Yeah, like for that. Some, dreams are really, really hard for me, I feel like. I always yeah. like to say, as yeah. a Pisces. But no, seriously, because I feel like I feel deeply like you you do as well. And I'm so, a Scorpio. So, I'm a double ooh. Scorpio. Okay, Double. exactly. So a lot of times that can really align to Scorpios and Pisces because we are going to feel yeah. the feelings and we're going to get into the gags. So Got it's the that same right. thing for me where I have to like regulate my emotions when I wake up in that space yeah. because yeah. it can quite literally throw off my entire day where I'm just like, ugh, like what was the dream trying to tell me? It Word. was like, yeah. the feeling was just yeah. so disgusting. I like wanted to get out of my body that morning because yeah. of how disturbing the dream was. So since I was having a bad day, I just decided to prioritize me and I got myself some lunch. I went to this Japanese bistro. I Ooh. got me some hibachi. So I'd say that's oh. my favorite thing of this week. I treated myself to a fancy little lunch. <laughs> that sounds lovely. And do it again. Do it again in another couple of weeks if you can. Yes, yes. I know my therapist always says that, like, celebrate your little wins, prioritize you. And even then, if there's nothing really to celebrate, just prioritize that self care. So I think I need to do that because I felt like a little thrill moment where I'm like, look at me clocking out for lunch and like going to get my little. Yeah. (laughs) See, see, and and when you get when you get these books in the mail, you should make that a self care day. Reading these books, going for lunch, getting some sushi in or whatever, you know. Yeah enjoy it you know oh my gosh and just to bring it right back to my book again (laughs) you were talking about nightmares Uh, i won't read it right now you can read it when you get it but there is a piece called caged and it's about my nightmares because yeah um yeah So, so you'll relate with that Okay, good. I can't yeah. wait. I literally have yeah. been waiting for this, guys that are listening. <laughs> Ellie sent me copies of her books, and I still have not gotten them yet. I'm like, oh, man, I was hoping to get them before we filmed. But I will make sure to reach out to you once I get yeah. that one in the DMs, and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, please, sis. I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Well, this brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you so, so much, Allie, for being here. Again, make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. I'm on my journey to my first 100 subscribers. Rate that five stars on Spotify. Follow on Spotify. Give me five stars and review on Apple Podcasts. And make sure that you guys follow on Instagram at a little bit a lot podcast. And your at on Instagram is Allie underscore author. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Allie. She is, like I said, a advocate 
You know, she has so many different resources out there, yep. and, you know, the way that she's helping people in her books. Yep. And on top of that, feel free to check out her other podcast episodes. She's been kind of on like a little press tour moment that I've been <laughs> living for. And she has been sharing different parts of her story on different platforms. So check those out because she gets really deep on some of them and I'm living for it. So I love it. So thanks again. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks, girl. Bye. Fully cause I make rich look rich off. Save your breath, baby. I'm not going home with y'all.